Welcome back to FLJ, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael, and in today's podcast episode, we are dealing with an interesting topic. The family of the Ubuntu flavors has grown considerably in the last 12 months. How can that be with the criticism from the community on Ubuntu and Canonical? The Linux distribution Ubuntu is developed, maintained and published by Canonical. Canonical is the company of the millionaire and space traveler Mark Shuttleworth. Canonical is very successful in the enterprise Linux environment. This includes various business areas such as Ubuntu Server, OpenStack, Kubernetes, IoT and, above all, far-reaching support and service offerings around the product range. When we are talking about Ubuntu in general, many mean the Ubuntu Desktop Edition. This is developed by Canonical and is available free of charge for private individuals and companies. For companies, in turn, special offers for support are offered for a fee. Private individuals and small businesses can benefit from a very wide range of offers and advantages in connection with Ubuntu Desktop, such as long product maintenance. Ubuntu was able to sweep the entire Linux scene in the late 2000s and was by far the most successful and popular Linux distribution for many years. This changed in the 2010s when Canonical changed its strategy, which led to a downturn in Ubuntu in particular. With the decisions and changes made, criticism of Ubuntu grew and many forks based on Ubuntu were able to profit from its former popularity and secure market share. A few years ago, however, the tide turned again for Ubuntu. Since version 2004, the focus has been more on the desktop and the desktop concept in general. From then on, technical innovations were realized with all new Ubuntu versions and the design of the Ubuntu desktop was developed with priority again. Ubuntu is again a distro for private people but also for business customers with Windows as desktop operating system who want to try Linux or develop on Linux because with Ubuntu 23.04 e.g. the integration in Azure Active Directory is possible. Many companies use Active Directory user management, whether locally, on-premise or in the Azure Cloud environment. Admittedly, completely uninteresting for private individuals, but extremely important for corporate customers because an Ubuntu client can now be authenticated and integrated like a Windows client, which makes the story much easier. For all Ubuntu's interesting merits, there has been and continues to be criticism of Canonical's decision and strategies. Canonical has a focus, and that focus is working towards a clear goal. Along the way to the goal, decisions are made in the one direction or another. The Linux community criticizes many of these decisions because they sometimes mean going it alone. But with all due respect, Linux often boasts of diversity and free decisions. When a company makes its decision, in that case of Canonical, it is open to criticism in the eyes of many. But why actually? Why are rights proclaimed when at the same time there are supposed to be exceptions? For me, this is incomprehensible. I generally welcome Canonical's decision even if I don't consider some of the consequences to be the best. And the Ubuntu family, which consists of the so-called flavors, is also growing. Under Ubuntu flavors, you can imagine a normal Ubuntu system with a different desktop. Ubuntu desktop comes with GNOME Shell. GNOME Shell is one of the most widely used Linux desktop solutions. However, there are other solutions such as KDE Plasma or XFCE environment. And these are provided with the flavors, each with its own version. It is precisely at this point that the Ubuntu family has recently experienced considerably growth. There have been three new members, Ubuntu Unity, Ubuntu Cinnamon, and Ubuntu. All in all, we now have 10 flavors. This is a respectable number because the flavors are not maintained directly by Canonical, but by volunteer developers who gather in corresponding projects that publish and maintain these flavors. So on the one hand, we see a lot of criticism in the community, but on the other hand, we see also new flavors that are consciously subordinated to Canonical's guidelines. How does that work? That is a critical question. The answer holds some potential of unrest and can easily be filled with polemic. But that's not the purpose of this podcast episode. We try to give a factual answer to this question. 
Let's look at the benefits of flavors. Flavors participate in the Ubuntu infrastructure and grassroots development of Ubuntu including the timely delivery of security patches. The developers of the flavors thus focus on the integration of the desktop solutions into the Ubuntu base. This allows synergies to be bundled and developer resources to be used in a target manner. The desktop is thus integrated in the best possible way and offers the best possible user experience on Ubuntu substructure. Let's look at the disadvantages of flavors. Not every distro can call itself Ubuntu Flavor. Canonical has set up certain criteria that have to be fulfilled. If these criteria are met, the distro can carry out something like an application process and in the end Canonical decides whether the candidate may become a flavor or not. The flavor is subject to certain requirements set by Canonical. One recent change to these guidelines that received media attention was that the flavors are no longer allowed to offer the Flatpak container solution and the basic installation but must instead rely on Canonical's in-house solution Snap. Furthermore, the flavors have to follow the six-month development circle of Ubuntu. This means that a new version is released every six months. Every fourth version is an LTS version, which is usually maintained for three years. After that, you have to switch to a successor version. With Ubuntu, it is five years LTS and if necessary can be extended by another five years via Ubuntu Pro subscription so that an Ubuntu desktop LTS version and server also gets up to 10 years support. Reasons for these are likely to be resources. Canonical pays its developers. The flavors are mainly based on volunteer developers, hence shorter maintenance periods for the LTS version, although three years is respectable. Let's look at the user base of Ubuntu and the flavors. The buzzword beginner distro is often mentioned. It is true that Ubuntu is a beginner-friendly distro because there is graphical assistance for everything and jumping into the console is no longer necessary. Furthermore, Ubuntu has put a lot of work into user-friendliness. There has also been a very good installer which is now completely revised. But it would be more accurate to say that Ubuntu Desktop is a desktop distro. In other words, it is a distro that was designed specially for the desktop and it does a very good job there. The range of users is correspondingly wide, from absolute beginners to ordinary desktop users, gamers, content creators and developers. Everyone is in good hands in the Ubuntu family. The loudest criticism will probably not come from Ubuntu users, but mainly from those who turned away from Ubuntu in disappointment or had never used Ubuntu seriously before. That is also understandable. If something works well, you don't say much about it. Only when something doesn't work as expected, people say negative things about it. This should also apply to Ubuntu. So we come to the conclusion that the number of critics is probably far smaller than the number of supporters in connection with the fact that the voices of the critics are conversely far louder than those of the supporters which suggests that many would reject or criticize Ubuntu. The very fact that the numbers of flavors is growing is a clear indicator that the Ubuntu base is seen as a more vital and stable environment than other grandparent distros such as Debian, OpenSUSE, Fedora or Arch. That developers continue to embrace Ubuntu is a sign that things are neither as bad as some suggest for Ubuntu nor that the Ubuntu base is unsuitable. After all, the developers of Ubuntu Unity, Edubuntu and Ubuntu Cinnamon could have chosen a different base, but they didn't, and that speaks for itself. And by the way, this also reflects in the fact that I use PopOS and Ubuntu as my main distros. So is the criticism of Ubuntu far from the community disproportionately heard? I think so. Many of the criticism are dedicatedly subjective. Some are also settled. Example. The unclear support situation with the base package in Multiverse and Universe. Ubuntu Pro also maintains about 23,000 other packages from Universe. You don't like Snap? Then delete Snap and work exclusively with Debian packages. Or do it like me and install Flatpak and work with Flatpak packages in addition to the Debian packages. No problem at all. So you see, a lot of things can be solved. But we don't live in a world where an Ubuntu system comes the way everyone likes it, but the way Canonical thinks is the best. 
you can customize it to your liking or take a different distro. That is your free decision and is not to be criticized. But it's the same with Canonical's decision. It is their distro, their house, their right, their rules. But hey, if we didn't have a so-called bad guy, it would be boring for many people, one might think at this point. I think there are more who are completely satisfied with Ubuntu. Or in other words, love it, leave it or change it. So love it, leave it or change it. The same applies here. You don't have to use Ubuntu if you don't like the canonical philosophy. But on the other hand, the number of people who use it and are happy with it should be far greater and the fact that developers are turning to it and starting new flavors should also be an indicator that Ubuntu continues to play in the Premier League. And perhaps Ubuntu will also surprise us with the coming versions, who knows? What do you think? I'm already curious about your opinion in the comments. Just feel free to share it. So that was today's podcast episode. Thank you for the kind attention and see you hopefully soon. Peace, ladies and gentlemen.